Okay, I want to welcome everyone to Agile Austin Agile at Scale Meetup um, for November. Today, we're going to have a topic on uh, Monte Carlo simulations and how to improve your forecast. Um, and so we'll get to that in just a second. We'll go through a few intro slides. If my computer will up there, now it's going to click through too fast. So our mission is to connect people and foster the professional growth um, through events such as this, um, the collaborative events to educate community on uncovering better ways to deliver value through agile values, principles, and practices. Um, and so that's the mission. The board members, we have um, the board members, Max, Steve, Scott, Ben, and Angela. Um, and so if you have any questions or interest around Agile Austin, you can reach out to them. You see the contact info board at agileaustin.org. Um, great way to get involved, uh, reach out. There's a lot of volunteer opportunities. Um, we also want to thank our sponsors, as you can see, our, our platinum and silver sponsors. So Retrospectives um, is, is our platinum sponsor. Um, and so thanking them, along with the silver sponsors of uh, Ad Meloria and Wellsky. So we thank them. Um, there's a couple ways to get involved with Agile Austin. You can sponsor or you can have a membership. The membership, it's a yearly membership of $35. It, it gives you access to the Slack channel, uh, member portal, you can vote and sit on the board. There's special events, uh, maybe some training discounts at times. Um, so there's 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 benefits around those memberships um, that we just had the Keep Austin Agile conference uh, last or earlier this month. I mean, um, and so I, I believe with membership, you also got a discounted rate on the on that. So as, as events happen, it provides you benefits in there. So I really encourage people to do their annual membership. Uh, so uh, it's a good reminder for me because I think mine expires sometime in the next month. I need to renew mine, but um, great way to get involved uh, with those. There are multiple meetups. So um, on the screen, there's there's these six that are, are pretty consistent. Uh, others could happen, if, um, but these are the, the six that have been uh, very consistent. Uh, we're the top middle one, Agile at Scale. So I hosted, or Ben Rogers, uh, he hosted. So uh, on the third Friday of each month from 12 to 1 p.m. Central Time. I know a lot of people on, on here may not be in Central Time, uh, but we're 12 to 1 Central. Uh, but there's other ones on here like Agile Coaching, The Book Club, Leaders, Lean Kanban, and Scrum Masters. So there's, a, a, in addition to the monthly meeting that, that happens. So there's a lot of opportunities. Um, some happen uh, on Fridays at lunchtime, like the leaders one happens the, the first Friday every month, um, the Lean Kanban one, the second Friday every month at noon, the Agile at Scale, the third. The other ones um, happen different times, uh, mostly in the evenings. Um, and so so you can see some of those um, that fit your, fit your needs. Um, this is actually the conference schedule slide. I forgot to remove that one out. Um, so I'll keep moving. We did just have a conference. So um, we are still having those. Uh, it was a hybrid conference, some in person, some remote. Um, so we're looking to do more of those kind of things as well. Um, interested in volunteering at Agile Austin? Uh, you can help co-host some of these special interest groups. Um, you can help lead those. Um, you can speak. We're always looking for speakers. Um, uh, or if you have ideas that you want to learn more about, let me know and I can try to find speakers. So um, great ways to do that as well. Um, Agile at Scale, this meetup is really about exchanging uh, knowledge uh, and learning and growing. So it's, and I'm going to try to I'll mute in just a minute. Uh, this this scale, this Agile at Scale meetup has been going on since 2016. Uh, so I started it back then. Ben joined me as a co-lead in 2020. Um, and so we're we're continuing to do that along the way. Um, the, the upcoming events, um, December being the third Friday of the month is you know, right before the, the Christmas holidays and a lot of people, school's already out on that day. And so a lot of time we, we tend to skip that one. January, we have, I'm, I'm talking to a couple of people, nothing um, confirmed just yet, but I expect to hear that real soon. February, I, I have TBD. Um, that one, I have a local company in Austin area willing to host. 
And so we may have a hybrid with both in person and remote uh, setup. Mm -hmm. And a good chance I will present something at that one just to make it easy since it's in person and I know I'll be there. So so look look more for that February to, to be coming. Um, so with that, I'm going to thank you for coming. I am going to mute everyone. So if you need to come back off, um, uh, you know, feel free to come back off. But I'm I'm going to hand this over to to Sonia and so she can start the presentation. So I'm going to stop sharing. <laughs> Hello everyone, I'm very happy and I'm super glad that you decided to join us today. My name is Sonia Siderova. I'm the founder and CEO of NAVE, a Kanban analytics suite that helps managers make reliable forecasts and deliver on their commitments consistently. So today I would like to talk about one of my most favorite topics, how to make reliable project forecasts. All right, let's get started. I am and, going to share so, this now. As, as you share, I, I forgot to mention, if anyone has questions, please post it in the chat. I'll be monitoring the chat and, and we'll take time at the end to, to be able to answer all of the, the questions in the chat. Okay, here we go. Let me see. I think it's all good now. You should be able to see my presentation. Perfect. Now, I hear clients and stakeholders ask this question all the time. How much time will this take? When, when will you be done? And coming up with the delivery date of a project certainly can be challenging, especially if you don't have the means to make reliable decisions at your disposal. So where does the problem come from? Well, the most common approach to project planning suggests that the team sits down together, they go through the individual work items and estimate the effort needed to complete each item, either in hours or story points. Then the times are accumulated and a margin is added on the top of the total sum in order to account for any unanticipated events. And the result looks something like we will need approximately 10 weeks to deliver or we'll need about five sprints to complete the work. But what's the chance of meeting that commitment? Would you commit to delivering in five sprints if you knew there was only a 20% chance of meeting that deadline? That's certainly something I don't recommend doing. Apart from being tremendously time and effort consuming, the main problem with this approach is that it's not reliable. And here are just a few reasons why these methods are fragile. Firstly, estimating the effort time required to complete your work items is a prediction based on guesswork, intuition, or good feeling. It doesn't use historical facts and it doesn't use past performance data to produce accurate results. Second, by evaluating the actual scope of the work, you are ignoring one of the major sources of inefficiency and delays, the waiting time in your system. Your effort time doesn't include the waiting time in your process, which usually represents anything from 60% to 99% of your delivery times. Remember this stat. The waiting time in your process represents anything between 60% and 99% of your delivery times. Evaluating the actual scope of the work is just not enough to provide a reliable delivery commitment. Your delivery time will always exceed your effort time. And last but certainly not least, commitments based on effort come as a single value. And thinking deterministically about the future is simply insufficient. There is always more than one possible outcome that might happen in the future. Now, let me tell you a story. Every morning, I have to drive my kids to school. Well, it's not really a school. My kids are still very young. They're five and seven now. It's more like a kindergarten within the same building as the primary school. They have the standard bell rings, classes, breaks in between. 
it really feels like school. And I find it awesome because when my daughter started first grade, the whole experience was so much smoother. So the first class starts at 8.45. And if you're not there on time, they close the main doors and yet you cannot get in anymore. So it's crucial for me to get there before 8.45. Otherwise, I have to look after two little kids for the whole day, which for all the parents in the audience, you know what this means, right? It means that I won't be able to do absolutely anything else. And even though our school is pretty close to our uh, house, it's about 10 kilometers away, it can take me anything from 10 to 40 minutes to get there depending on whether or not there is a construction work or a local street market uh, taking place, for example. And I didn't, uh, I even didn't make it once because there was a major car incident and the traffic was horrible. My point is, I never know exactly how long it will take to reach my destination. The outcome will often be different. And the only thing I can do to achieve my goal is to make sure I leave home early enough to have a sufficiently high level of confidence that I will arrive on time. You can never have 100% certainty about what will happen in the future. There are always multiple scenarios that may occur. There is no model that produces a single certain outcome that guarantees you will achieve your goal. The exact same principle applies when it comes to making delivery commitments. You can never have 100% certainty about what will happen in the future. So every time when you say something like, we will deliver this project in two months, and you don't provide any information related to the certainty level of achieving that goal, you are making deterministic estimate. Let me ask you something. Can we predict the exact delivery date of our projects despite the unpredictability of knowledge work? And exact is the key word here. Are we capable of predicting the exact time a feature will take to go through the whole process while maintaining the rest of the work in progress at the same time? Is it possible to predict that there won't be any additional work coming in between any defects, dependencies, bottlenecks, or external blockers that might cause a delay. There are two approaches to making delivery predictions, a deterministic estimate and a probabilistic forecast. What's the difference? Estimates are predictions based on guesswork, judgment, intuition, or good feeling. The prediction is delivered as a single value. It could be a date or a number of hours, days, or story points, for example. An estimate doesn't involve any probability of its occurrence. When you estimate your delivery, you don't know whether there is a 20% chance or 50% chance or 80% chance of meeting your commitment. The biggest problem with deterministic estimations is that we assume we know what will happen in the future with 100% certainty upfront. Forecasts, on the other hand, forecasts are based on historical performance data. The prediction is communicated as a range of values and the probability of those values occurring. Producing probabilistic forecasts is the first step towards making an objective decision about when you will deliver your project or how much work your team can actually handle during your next release. So how can we make reliable forecasts about our projects when there is so much uncertainty that we have to deal with? The secret here lies in accepting that there is more than one possible result that might happen in the future and managing that uncertainty effectively. Let me make this clear. There is a need to clearly differentiate between the analysis process and the forecasting process during your project planning stage. 
The main goal here, the main goal of the analysis process is to gain an understanding of the problem you're trying to solve. During the analysis, you must unambiguously define the what and why. And if your team starts arguing whether something is five points or eight points during the analysis process, this is a red flag. That's the realm of the forecasting process, right? During analysis, the actual conversation behind what needs to be done is the most important thing. Now, the main goal of the forecasting process is to provide a reliable delivery commitment and ideally, you should not spend more than a couple of minutes doing so. The tools provide these answers for us already. So here, the only question is, what's the confidence level we're willing to live with? Now, I want to spend some time to focus on the forecasting part of the project planning process. Now, to provide a reliable commitment, you need to communicate the range of the delivery dates you can hit together with the probabilities that come with them. Your commitment should look something like, we expect to deliver this project before, not on, before the 5th of March, and we are 85% certain that we can achieve this goal. Are we saying that we will deliver exactly on the 5th of March? No, we aren't. What we're saying is that we'll probably finish earlier, but it won't be later than the 5th of March. There is an 85% probability that we'll keep our promise. Pay attention to the language we use here. It may seem to be a simple wording change, but it will have significant implications. Every time you provide a delivery commitment, ask yourself, what's the chance of meeting that goal. And if the approach you use to make delivery predictions doesn't enable you to quantify that probability, it's worth considering an alternative. Remember, the main purpose of making estimations is to manage risks effectively. There is always risk involved, and the most effective approach to managing realistic expectations is to quantify that risk by assessing the probability of achieving your goals. Every prediction should communicate the risk associated with it. Now, how can we quantify that risk? The best predictor of your future behavior is your past behavior. More often than not, your past is going to reflect the future especially if you're in control of your management practices. And there is a straightforward technique that will enable you to come up with an accurate project delivery commitment without spending any extra time and effort. And that's the realm of probabilistic forecasting. You no longer have to evaluate your work items in terms of hours or story points. What you actually need to do is look into your past performance and analyze it to produce probabilistic outcomes. And there is a tool at your disposal that will enable you to do just that. That tool is called the Monte Carlo simulation. Now, when determining the delivery date of your project, we use Monte Carlo to come up with a range of commitments and the probabilities that come with each of them. The simulation relies on a large number of random trials based on your historical performance data to predict your throughput for a future time frame. Pay attention to this. And if you are multitasking, please come back to me. Throughput is the number of items completed in a certain time period. It represents your historical data and it accounts for all the variability in your system, including the effort time plus the waiting time in your workflow. Do you see how we removed all the assumptions from the equation? We only work with facts. There are no assumptions here. And Monte Carlo uses your historical throughput. In the simulation, you define the start date here on the top, and the number of items in the scope of your project, and then the simulation will provide a range of possible outcomes, 
and the probability that comes with each of them. It will use the throughput of a random day in the past to simulate how many work items are likely to get done on any day in the future. Now, this is a screenshot of our analytical tool NAIF. And in this simulation, here at the bottom, we can see the basis that the simulation is working with. So let's say that on September 10th, you had a throughput of two tasks. You've delivered two tasks. The simulation takes this number and assumes that this is how much work items will be completed on November 1st. Then to project the probable throughput of November 2nd, it takes the throughput of another random day in the past and so on. The simulation is repeated tens of thousands of times before the results are presented in the form of a probability distribution with percentiles increasing from left to right. And in this specific simulation, we set the scope to be 44 tasks and stated that we want to start working on it on November 1st. The simulation tells us that there is an 85% probability of finishing this scope before the 19th of April. The further you go in time, the greater the certainty of completing the projected outcome. Now, you can commit to project scope, delivery time, or quality but not to all three. So my advice would be pick time and quality and keep the scope flexible. The main benefit of using Monte Carlo simulations is that the method clearly defines the risks associated with certain outcomes. The percentile lines that you're seeing here on the distribution, 50%, 70%, 85%, 95%, communicate the risk you're managing. The probabilities that the simulation produces quantify that risk in terms of percentages. The question is no longer how many items can you complete before your next release or when you will be done with that project. The question is now, how much risk are you willing to take? Now, if you plan with less confidence, let's say, you commit to delivering before the 27th of March here on the 50th percentile, which is, by the way, the exact same confidence level that comes with flipping a coin. It's where we'll either make it or not, right? You really ought to ask yourself whether you want to manage that level of risk. I want you to think of project planning as gambling. Guess where the name of Monte Carlo comes from? The number of items we could supposedly deliver is higher at the lower confidence level. But how much risk do you want to take? During our project planning process, we want to mitigate the risk as much as we can. 50% certainty is very low. Ideally, you should be working with 70, 85, or even 95% certainty when you're making your commitments. If you look into the far most right sidebar here on this specific Monte Carlo simulation, you will see that the probability is greater than 99%. Remember, there is no such thing as 100% certainty that something will happen in the future. Your stakeholders want to be as confident as possible that you will deliver on your commitments and they want to reduce the risk of failure as much as they can. To help them understand the concept easily, communicate your project plan in terms of risk. This is their language. This is the language they will understand. Now, if you commit to the delivery date on the 50th percentile, you will be wrong one out of every two times. If you commit to the date on the 85th percentile, you will be wrong one out of every seven times. If you go for the 95th percentile, the risk of failure drops down to one of every 20 times. That's how you manage realistic expectations and plan your project in the most effective manner. What happens if you don't manage to meet your commitment? Does it mean your forecasts don't work? No, because 
if you've committed to the 85th percentile, there is still a 15% chance of not making it. You just ended up in this 15%. Always remember, there is no model that provides 100% certainty that we can achieve something. We can only commit with high confidence, and the higher the confidence, the smaller the chance of failure. Hey, hey Sonia, yeah. on, we had a, a question, and since um, I thought it was uh, good uh, since you had the graph, but are, are you simulating using data from a specific project or a variety of projects? So for that specific example, Monte Carlo is connected to, a, to an instance in JIRA. Every dashboard at NAVE corresponds to a board in JIRA. And you have the flexibility to decide whether you want to have the data for one project or multiple projects. Because in JIRA, you can use the JQL filter of the board itself to fetch data from multiple projects, right? So if your board in JIRA, let's say, is configured to have the data from many projects, you can then connect that board to a dashboard at NAVE and the simulation is going to use that same data. So the scope of the data is defined by the JQL of the board. So the answer to that question is you can do whatever you need. For that specific example, the data is just for one project, but you have the flexibility to include more data if you need to, and that the scope of the data is controlled within JIRA. And then that's how you define what's the data that NAIF will be able to access and use as a base of the simulation. I hope this answers your question. Okay, let's move on. Um, let me know if, if uh, you have any follow-up questions. I'm, I'm going to address them right after uh, the session. Um, so, I have some tough love for you guys. The fact that you've come up with an initial delivery commitment doesn't mean your job is done. The initial project planning phase is just that, an initial delivery prediction. It's just the beginning. Don't fall into the trap of assuming that everything will go as planned. On the contrary, your work has just begun. Now, let's take a step back. Just because you have 44 stories in your backlog, this doesn't mean that these exact 44 stories will be delivered before the date you've committed. That's not what Monte Carlo is telling you. What the simulation is telling you is, if you have 44 items, work in progress items included, if you have 44 items, they will be done before the 19th of April, and there is an 85% certainty that you will achieve that goal. Remember, during the initial planning project stage, you still only have a high level understanding of your work items. Once you initiate the project, you will probably split your stories. Some of them will drop off, more will be added. You will discover the effects and additional work will come in between. The secret here is that you can take any 44 items you want, and the simulation Monte Carlo produced will still be valid. Once you begin your work and start delivering results, you should continuously reevaluate your forecast and adjust your course accordingly. You need to look into your plan from a continuous perspective and decide how best to fill the spots for these 44 items over time. Now, let me tell you another story. My husband and I, we moved to Belgium about 10 years ago. And I always remember the Belgium Red Devils playing at the FIFA World Cup back in 2018. It was pre-COVID time. There were thousands of people watching the game on a big screen in the center of our town, drinking beer, singing, dancing, and bursting into cheers every time we scored. And we were watching the game against France. And if you're a football fan, you probably know all these websites that give you the probability of how a game will end. I was checking out the forecast every two minutes. So the approach that these websites use is pretty smart. 
As the game progresses and teams score or don't score, the chances of your team winning will change as well. Every time a new event happens, the model is updated and a new prediction of how the game will end takes place. Now, imagine you are the coach of a team and you observe the probability of your team winning going down. If that's the case, you would probably want to make some changes, right? Switch the positions of certain players, let new players enter the game, or swap the initial strategy altogether to increase your chances of winning. Either way, when provided with that information, it would be simply unreasonable not to make any changes. Your tactics have to adjust based on the new information you're gathering. This is a classic example of continuous forecasting. Once you have your initial forecast, you need to continuously reevaluate it and adjust your course accordingly. Your forecast will change as you deliver more work. Remember, we used our past throughput in the Monte Carlo simulation. Your throughput will vary based on any changes in the scope, your team, the efficiency of your workflow, all these factors will affect the base you use to perform your initial prediction. That's why continuous forecasting is essential. To be able to deliver on your commitment, you need to make sure that you have your finger on the pulse of the work. And I've said this many times already, but I can't emphasize it enough. When we talk about making delivery predictions, we need to acknowledge that there are many possible scenarios that could occur in the future. And probably the biggest advantage of using Monte Carlo is the fact that it produces a range of outcomes and the probabilities associated with each of them. It enables us to think about our commitments in terms of the risk we're willing to take. Now, Let's put this strategy into action. Let's go back to our initial example. If we say that, hypothetically, our project started on November 1st. We have 44 items on our backlog, and we've committed to delivering the work before the 19th of April. That outcome comes with an 85% certainty of us meeting our goal. Now, here is a spreadsheet that we call the Release Tracking Dashboard. It's an Excel sheet with the following columns. Here are the first column, it's, is today's date. Then the second one is our plan release date. From then on, we have in the third column here, we put the probability percentage of us meeting our goal, which is initially set to 85%. Then the fourth column is the remaining number of stories in our backlog. The fifth one is our committed delivery date, which is the 19th of April in this case. And the last column can hold any additional comments or adjustments we want to keep track of. We also build a chart uh, here that is showing us, that's enabling us to track how the completion likelihood trends build over time. Our goal, is to update that release tracking dashboard every two weeks. From here on, we should track our progress on a regular basis. So we start working on November 1st, and as we deliver work, we want to apply the continuous forecasting strategy to reevaluate our initial commitment. We run the simulation again on the 15th of November. So we change the start date here of the simulation to November 15th, and we extend the throughput date range to account for the work we have completed so far. So the end date here of the dashboard will be the 15th of November. Let's say that the remaining scope is 38 work items. What the simulation says now is that based on our performance in the past two weeks, the probability that, com that comes with our initial commitment has moved to 90%, which is awesome, which is great. This means that we're on schedule and the work is moving smoothly through the process. Now, if you observe that the probability to hit your initial commitment is dropping down, this is a red flag. 
And you need to act accordingly in order to avoid delays. You need to continuously reevaluate your forecast and take actions accordingly in order to successfully get back on track. And after a few weeks, your dashboard will look something like this. The most important thing is to stay on top of the progress you make and ensure you take action accordingly. This is just an example, but in this specific instance, we can see that in the week, starting from 29th of November, then uh, the project goes off. And the solution, a solution could be to reduce your WIP limits, which would enable you to stop multitasking and really focus on the outstanding work. A decision that will ultimately result in an increase in your throughput. And even if the adjustments you make don't pay off, you become aware of the situation and you can communicate it to your customers or stakeholders early so they can react on time. Acting like this builds credibility and shapes our reputation as professionals. So there are two options for you guys. If you want to try this out, contact me on LinkedIn. I'm on LinkedIn. Contact me there and I'm going to send you a link so you can copy, make a copy of that spreadsheet and you can play with this a little bit. Or if you want to see it with your own data and you want to automate the process, I'll show you how you can try NAVE for free. And then you can see all of these numbers and all of these projections calculated automatically for you. Just let me know, contact me on LinkedIn, and I will help you get onboarded with either of the approach you choose. Now, to sum this up real quick, Monte Carlo simulations clearly define the risk associated with a certain outcome. When it comes to planning, the conversation now moves from when will you be done to how much risk are you willing to take? The fact is, the Monte Carlo simulation has already provided the answer to that first question. And now it's up to us to decide the level of risk we're willing to live with. Using continuous forecasting will enable you to understand whether the risk you've taken is increasing or decreasing as you work through your project. The simulation is there at your disposal to provide real-time feedback on whether you will make it on time or you need to adjust your course to mitigate the risk of failure. Take advantage of it. That's the most effective approach to managing realistic expectations, and it only takes a couple of minutes to produce the results for you. So now... I just want to spend a couple of minutes to talk about the prerequisites to making probabilistic forecasting work in your context. First, you don't need to split your stories into even sizes to make this work. Remember, the forecast accounts for all the variability in the system, including the size of your work items. The more interesting question here is, how much data do you need to make reliable predictions? What if you don't currently have any historical data? What if you do plenty of, you do have plenty of data, but you can't actually rely on it? The fact that forecasts, the forecast, probabilistic forecasts are based on your past performance data doesn't mean that you need a ton of data in order to come up with reliable delivery predictions. Not at all. Whether you have been collecting data from the very beginning of your board creation or you are just getting started with new teams, this is beside the point. The main and only prerequisite of producing reliable forecasts is to maintain a stable system. And this is exactly what I teach in our sustainable predictability program. It's a seven step roadmap to building stable delivery systems. And stable systems are delivery systems that are optimized for predictability. If your delivery system is optimized for predictability, you won't need more than 20 or 30 completed items to come up with accurate results. It's not about quantity. It's all about taking control of your management practices and ensuring you deliver results in a consistent manner. The accuracy of your forecasts strongly depends on the stability of your system. In fact, 
if you don't maintain a stable system, nothing will work. If you don't take control of your management practices to enable predictable delivery results, nothing will work. There will be no approach that can give you a reliable delivery prediction. You will be better off buying a pair of dice and rolling them. You would be working with the same probability of achieving your goals. The only prerequisite to making accurate delivery forecasts and using pretty much any approach to forecasting and to make it work is to optimize your system for predictability. So if your data is all over the place and there is a huge gap between the percentiles on your charts, I would be thrilled to welcome you to our program and sort this out together. I do want to end this up with a very special offer. Now, if you're ready to take the next step and put everything we've talked about today into practice, you don't want to miss this out. Our Black Friday sale starts right now. From today to the 30th of November, you can save 30% of all annual plans at NAFE, as well as all licenses for the Sustainable Predictability Program. Go to getnave.com forward slash Agile Austin right now. On that specific page, you'll be able to try both our analytical suite and get instant access to the first module of the program for free. If after a couple of weeks, you decide to subscribe to an annual plan at NAVE or enroll in the entire program, make sure you use code NAVEBLACK22 to apply your 30% discount. The offer is valid till the 30th of November, so don't delay. Go check it out. It's getnave.com forward slash Agile Austin and see a dashboard with your data or get access to our digital course. All the licenses come with a 12 months of Slack support. I want you to take advantage of all the experience and know-how my team and I have gained throughout the years. We'll dive deeper into your own context and we'll give you some bespoke actionable insights to help you make progress faster. So it's getnave.com forward slash Agile team. All right, my friends, I hope you enjoyed this session and I would be happy to answer any questions you may have. Yeah, so I'm, I'm gonna go through the questions in the chat, right, you know, from the top, uh, but um, uh, the one, it just moved on me, but someone had a question about um, using this, using Monte Carlo simulation for when, when the project stops and restarts multiple times how to use it when the project stops yeah, and like how robust is it and able to to handle stopping and starting a lot of times okay so it's not really about the tool it's about the reliability of your data right because the tool is using your data to make your predictions the more stable your system is and the more reliable your data is the better the results that the simulation is going to give you. So as I mentioned, we really need like 20 to 30 completed items to come up with accurate results. Now, if you start and stop and start and stop your projects all the time, at the moment that you start it again, and you really want to know when you will be done, the most important thing to ask yourself is, is my past, past data, is the data that I have collected still relevant? Does it actually represent our current conditions? If not, my advice is to really start tracking from the moment back in time, from the moment that the data that you have represents your current conditions. So if that's not the case, just stop tracking from today. And as I mentioned, as long as you have control over your management practices, you have process policies in place, you have like the setup is, is, is already in there on, on your side, you don't need more than 20 to 30 completed items to come up with accurate results. So my answer is look into, the, look into your data and look into any variations in your performance. At NAFE, we have plenty of other tools that will help you evaluate um, the stability of your system and the predictability of your system. So there are line charts that will enable you to understand whether there are a lot of deviations of your performance, which usually uh, are corres correspond to certain changes that you implement. So as long as you understand why these deviations are happening and they're expected, and you understand 
uh, how changing your, let's say, system design or the structure of your team, uh, you understand how this affects your performance, you're in a perfect place, right? Because I'm always saying this, don't be afraid of bad, of, of like, if your data is all over the place or if the numbers don't look good, don't be afraid when you see that. You should only be afraid if you see your performance changing and you don't understand why is that happening. So my answer to this question is it depends on the reliability of your data and whether if the data that you currently have corresponds, um, corresponds to the conditions that you have, right? Okay. And if that's not the case, start tracking from there on. Okay. And then it was answered in chat, but we want to hear yours. Um, but if you're using probabilistic forecasting, are you still using story points? Okay. Both things have nothing in common because, as I mentioned, we are trying to remove all the assumptions from the equation, right? And story points, they're based on assumptions. Okay, they're not, they're based on a, a good feeling, they're based on the experience that the team has in order to come up with a certain outcome. Now, if you use story points and you um, you come up with an end date of your project by the, using this approach, and this is working for you, by all means, keep doing this, right? There is no point of looking for solution of a problem that you don't have. If you use story points, though, and you, this doesn't work for you, and the predictions that you come up are not realistic, they're not reliable, and you're constantly struggling to deliver on your commitments, keep doing that, but introduce the probabilistic forecasting approach using your throughput as a parallel, in parallel. Provide the results from both the approaches at the same time, and at some point, let people see which approach is the faster one, the easiest, the easier one, and the most important thing, the most reliable one. Okay. Well, um, someone else had a question. Is there a connection in Nave to Azure DevOps? Yes, there is. So there are a few integrations that we provide. Um, we provide integrations with Azure DevOps, with Ajira, uh, Trello, Asana, and we also have a version that you can use to upload uh, CSV files or JSON files in case you maintain strict security policies or your instance is not publicly available. We have an API that will enable you to automate the process and to anonymize your data if needed. It's all in place. So go check it out. And if you if you start uh, if you start if you try NAVE now and you decide to move on to a paid subscription by the end of the month, you will be able to take advantage of our Black Friday offer. So go ahead and check it out. Okay, cool. And I have one other question about what assumptions underlie the forecast and what's the impact of scope differences on the simulation? The simulation uses your truth puts. That's the only thing that it relies on. The number of items you've completed in a certain period of time. That's it. So this is going to be the base that uh, the simulation is going to run. And the results of the simulation and the deviations between the results in the simulation will depend on the consistency and deviation of your throughput, of your historical throughput. That's it. OK. And I think, think the other questions they posted right before you answered um, so you had already answered them around, you know, does um, thing need to be approximately the same size, uh, how much data is needed, all of So I think you've covered most of the questions. So see if anyone has any other questions. Hmm, doesn't sound like it. Yeah. Um, if there well, is well, anything, thank you. It's, yeah. If you come up with anything, guys, I'm on LinkedIn. Just contact me in there. I would love to continue the conversation. Yep. Great. All right. With that, we'll we'll end for today. Thank you again for coming. That's I've been using Monte Carlo simulation since 2015, so uh, I can definitely speak that I, I 
don't use story points. I don't do those things because this was more reliable, faster, right? Everything around it was better. So uh, I, I appreciate this. It's good getting this message out. <laughs> well, it was my pleasure. It was a great pleasure yeah. to meet all of you guys. Thank you very yeah. much for this opportunity. And yeah. I wish you a wonderful day ahead. All right. Thank you. Bye.